I know a lot of our country is covered in snow, but we thought we'd bring you a little taste of spring. Let's do it, folks. We're here in Carlsbad, California, out on the bluffs in Tamarack. What a beautiful spot. I know it's been raining here a bunch, and so many of you have had crazy weather, but spring is around the corner, including Easter, which we'll talk about in just a few moments. Well, my name is Trent Jenkins, and we're online community pastor, and so glad to have you with us here today. And that's what we're trying to do, is create community. And one of those ways that we try to do it is through life groups. Let's check this out. Winter life group season is officially over. No! But spring quarter starts in two weeks. Yes! 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 But the spring quarter is only nine weeks long. No! But groups officially start again at the end of summer. Yeah! Wait, can we meet unofficially during summer? Yep. Yeah! Join a life group today. Life groups, I know so many of us, we can't do life without them. And you're saying, why? What's the deal with them? Well, because life groups is the central core for North Coast Church, where we build community, we dive into God's word, we support one another in prayer. We would love for that to be able to be the case for you as well. To get signed up for a life group, whether it's in person by one of our campuses, or maybe it's around the country, or you can end up joining an online group, simply go to our website and click on the Life Group banner. There you'll find out all the details that you need to know about Life Groups. Well, Easter is coming up. We'd encourage you, join us in our 28-day devotional as we're going through Matthew leading up to Easter. You can join us by simply texting the keyword study to this phone number right here on your screen. And you can check our website for all the information needed for our Good Friday services or our Easter services, which are located at all of our campuses and online. Without further ado, we got a special guest that we're gonna be having do our message today. Ricky Jenkins is a favorite of North Coast Church. Can't wait for you to be able to hear him. But before that, we wanna make sure that you get connected through our connection card, get your message notes on our website, and then put in your prayer request by texting in to this phone number right here on your screen. We'd love to be praying for you. We got worship and then Pastor Ricky Jenkins coming to us from Southwest Church in Palm Desert. Thank you so much for joining us. This is gonna be an amazing message.
North Coast, look up. Look up. North Coast, come on. Everyone look up here. I know you're ready for the video bumper to play and then the message. We're not doing that this week. Why? Because I am bringing you great news and then I'm bringing you bad news and then we'll go to the video bumper. Great news is my dear friend, one of my closest friends in ministry, Ricky Jenkins. He's done our men's retreats. He's been a guest speaker here before. By far the most popular guest speaker ever at North Coast Church. He and I are going to be swapping churches. Several times this year, he's going to be at North Coast which means I will be at his church, um, Southwest Church out at Indian Wells on the other side of Palm Springs. He's been a pastor there for six years. He's been a pastor though for about 25 years. I love his marriage with April and their three kids and who this guy is. And today you get to hear from Ricky Jenkins continuing in our series right now of Checkmate through the book of 1 John. Let me tell you the bad news. The switch isn't permanent. You don't get to keep them. I am going to come back. I know, you booing right now, throwing stuff at the screen. That's fine. But for this weekend, here's what we're going to do. We're going to roll the bumper right now. He's going to come out. Can you please, because we're not used to guest speakers around here at North Coast. So can you please let him know how much you already love and appreciate this man, one of my dear friends. Roll the bumper. And then Pastor Ricky Jenkins.
God bless you real good, North Coast Online. I'm so excited to be back with what I consider to be one of God's great churches anywhere, North Coast Church. God bless each and every one of you and your families and your relationships that you represent. Excited about God's word, what he's doing in and through North Coast Church. Thank you, North Coast, always for being the kind of church family that stays centered on the gospel of Jesus Christ and holds to the Bible. We love you so much, and I consider North Coast to be one of God's great churches anywhere. Shout out to all the team, online pastor and staff and leaders that make this place continue to go. I'm so happy that because of a lot of faithful folks, you and I get to connect in this space together. And how remiss were I to be were not to just stop and just pay homage and honor to my my pal, my compadre, mi amigo, Pastor Chris Brown. Proverbs 17, 17 North Coast says that a friend loves at all times and that a brother is born for adversity. And I just want to thank Chris and Amy for their friendship to April and me. It's just an honor to do life with you, bud. It's an honor to know you. The joy that you fill a room up with every time you walk into the place has truly impacted my life. Thank you for being that brother that's loved me at all times. And when my life has faced challenges and circumstances, you've been that brother that stood by next to me in April during those times of adversity. Man, I just love you. And thank you so much for this opportunity to preach God's word to all of you today. I have your Bibles meet me in 1 John chapter 5, verses 6 through 12. As we continue back in a series that our church is entitled uh, Checkmate, It's Your Move. It's a three-month study in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And obviously, if you've been tracking with us, North Coast Online, whereas the entire last calendar year, our church family delved deeply into the Gospel of John to consider the good news that is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. As we take these next three months in the first, second, and third, John, we're begging this question, how now shall we live? In light of what Jesus has done, and he has made his move, and he has lived a life of righteousness and purchased your redemption on a cross, what is the move you're going to make in your life? What will you decide about Jesus Christ? It was scholar uh, David T. Allen who said of John, the writer of the passage I'm about to read here in a few minutes, he says that it is John who wrote the gospel of John to detail those accomplishments that Jesus did in his past. He said next that it is John who wrote the book of Revelation to detail those accomplishments Jesus will make in the future. But it's finally, it is John who writes 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John so that you and I may consider how we're going to respond to Jesus right now in our present. It is your move to respond to what Jesus Christ has done for you 2,000 years ago. Now, last weekend, Chris was preaching, and he urged us to consider the question, which one do you want? Do you want the good life or do you want God's life that Jesus Christ offers you, the only path that offers true contentment and peace and wholeness in our lives. Uh, this weekend, we're going to tap into even a deeper description of what it means to walk towards God's life by putting our trust and faith in Jesus. So let's go down to 1 John uh, chapter 5, verses 6 through 12. Here now, the word of Almighty God, John writes, this is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Uh, not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood. And these three agree. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater, for this is the testimony of God that he has borne concerning his son. Verse 10, whoever believes in the son of God has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his son. And this is the testimony, I love this part, that God gave us eternal life and this life is in his son Hear the crux of the passage, North Coast. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. 
the very words of God. First John chapter five, verses six through 12, I've read from the greatest book ever written. And I bear witness this day that all of its words are true. Amen. Amen. Let's jump right into this. Uh, now, obviously, uh, we're going to come back to this later, but just with me reading that passage, just a perusal, of First John chapter five, verses six through twelve, you would have immediately noticed the word testimony or testify peppered throughout the passage. We're going to kind of come back to that later, but essentially, what I want you to understand is that the word testimony kind of depicts what John is trying to get done today. He's delivering to us a testimony, a veritable witness as to who Jesus. Christ is and what Jesus Christ longs to do in your life. And we're going to come back to this idea of testimony and testifying later. But for now, just know that when I started studying this passage and the word testimony just appeared over and over and over again, it had me going back to my childhood. Now, I grew up in um, the traditional uh, black church of the deep South. I was born and raised in the state of Mississippi. And uh, in those days, the old country church, every Sunday morning in service, we had something that we called testimony service. Uh, not a lot of you maybe grew up in church or even grew up in the South, but it was just this lock and stock moment every Sunday morning in service where we had what we call testimony service. Y'all, it was literally open mic in the church. Like real talk, they would just have a 15 minute window that always went like an hour and a half, but they have this 15 minute window where they would literally pass the microphone to whoever they wanted to, to say whatever they wanted to say right up in the service. Now we don't do that no more because y'all crazy. Okay. We just don't, we don't do it. But anyways, we did it back in the day. So the microphone, we usually go to those older Christians who would come up and y'all, we had the same script. Everybody would start off the same way. They would start off as a giving honor to God who is the head of my life. I thank the Lord for my being here today. I give honor and thanks to God who has seen me through danger seen and unseen. I could have been dead and sleeping in my grave. They had this whole script, but then they would tell a story of God's goodness in their life. And to just be quite frank with you, before long, the music would start going and people would would start singing and those old war-torn saints would find their joy of Jesus all over again. And in my church where I come from, they would literally dance before the Lord. Don't be alarmed. I'm not going to dance right now, but that was the joy that they had in Jesus Christ. Now the queen in my home church of testimony service was my great aunt Chris, God rest her soul. Her name was Christola Jenkins because <laughs> she was named after her dad who was named Chris. And that's how we did it in the South. And, and Aunt Chris was the queen of testimony service. She would testify every Sunday about God's goodness and stories of what God was doing in her life. And Aunt Chris would be the queen of dancing and cutting a rug to express her joy in the Lord. I remember being a little boy pulling Aunt Chris to the side. I said, Aunt Chris, talk to me about your dancing and your joy in Jesus. Why do you always dance all the time? I'll never forget the day Aunt Chris pulled me to the side and says, baby, I didn't always know Jesus. Baby, I grew up in Chicago and back in those days in the late 30s and the 40s, I was just far from God. I, baby, I, I drank all the time. I I smoked stuff all the time, baby. I, I was known as a club hopper. I would just go from club to club and just dancing my, my cares away. I didn't have any joy, didn't have any peace. But baby, I came to church one day and I put my trust and faith in Jesus. And the spirit took away that desire for alcohol. And the spirit took away that desire for that substance abuse. But baby, I did notice that I still loved dancing. But this is why I dance. Uh, Jesus kept my dance, but he change my partner. And as we tiptoe to our passage, John is encouraging his readers that Jesus wants to take some stuff away from you, but keep some stuff in you, but just change your partner. And in so doing, he shows us the beauty of what it means to put our trust and faith solely in Jesus Christ, the one true and living son of God. I'd like to walk through this passage, and in so doing, I want to talk about the worth of a testimony surrounding Jesus Christ and why you should consider putting your trust and faith in him. And in so doing, I want to bring an answer to these three questions, the table of contents for our time together today, North Coast Church. I want to beg the question, what is John saying? 
Secondly, how is John saying it? And then thirdly, how will you respond? Now, I'd like to tag this text, what's the verdict? Let's pray. Holy Spirit, I pray that even as you inspired the words of this passage, that you would inspire the words that we will share together now, Lord God, as we break the bread of life. I pray, God, that it would feed our souls and our hearts and even our minds and our lives and speak to every facet of life as we consider the worthiness of Jesus Christ and putting our faith in him. Holy Spirit, would you move in every heart and every mind and every life right now as only you can? For God, I ask it in the name of Jesus Christ and every heart said together, amen. So North Coast, let's go ahead and jump into it. The first question I want to beg of our passage is this, is what is John saying? What is John saying here in our passage? Now, though John's argument is not uh, readily easily or understood, right? Like what is he talking about with water and blood and the spirit and these three agree? His argument is not readily understandable, but his big picture idea well, sure is. In fact, the entire emphasis of our passage is crystallized in verse 12. When you look at it with me, John says to us, whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. And that's it right there. That's the big idea of what John's trying to get done in our hearts today. He's putting it out there so as to say, if you have Jesus Christ, okay, you will have life. When you hear life, think meaning and contentment and purpose and worth. But if you do not have Jesus, the son of God, you will not have life. You will not have meaning and purpose in full contentment. He's putting it out there. Okay. That's John's purpose. That's John's point. That's John's hope. Look at it clearly on screen with me so we can beg the question. What is John saying? He's saying that Jesus Christ is the son of God and therefore the only way to salvation. I'm going to read again. Jesus Christ is the son of God and therefore the only way to salvation. When you hear salvation, think reconciliation with God. Think eternal life. Think purpose and meaning and true happiness. John is saying that's his big idea. Okay. Let me put it out there even more explicitly. And so far, North Coast, that John is putting it out there explicitly and bring us to this focal point. Here it is. All people on planet Earth, I know that's dramatic, but it's what he's saying. All people on planet Earth are headed to only one of two destinies. Here it is, friends. We're either headed towards eternal life or eternal death. That is the argument that John is positing towards us. He's saying there's only two options, okay? If you have Jesus Christ, the son of God, you have life. If you do not have Jesus Christ, the son of God, you will not have life. So what's the import of John's proclamation here is this, because at the end of the day, John's not really presenting Jesus through the guise of this both and scenario. He's presenting Jesus through the guise of an either or scenario. Do you get that? He's not saying that, that, that you get to just say, hey, okay, I'll add Jesus to this inventory of all these other avenues I'm pursuing in my life and in the world, okay? John's saying Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and to not have Jesus as the sole savior and landing place for your identity and worth, you will not have life. So get the picture, North Coast, for a culture like our own, 2024, a culture that's given to accommodation. We are given to excessive luxury. We are given to endless options and endless supply. Can I get a Costco witness? Okay. John's saying in this life, this little vapor of years that you and I have been given, there are but two choices. It's not Jesus plus this religion and that philosophy and this way of doing life and this school of thought, okay? He's saying, accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior and have life or reject Jesus Christ and not have life. That's what John is saying to us today. Now, don't go there, okay? Don't get, 
Don't go hellfire and brimstone-esque on me, okay? Don't go fundamentalist on me, okay? Don't go old school on me, because John's not doing that either. And we're going to see in a few minutes, John's not lacking in grace here. We're going to see in a minute, he's not even lacking in nuance. I think what John's doing for us today, he's just hinting at the truth that there come those moments in life where you and I need to kind of be wedged into a corner and forced to decide how we're going to choose and how we're going to make choices on the biggest questions of life. That's what's going here. And I think what John is saying to whoever's watching right now is that there come those moments where the Holy Spirit moves on your soul and and beckons you to consider deeper questions in your life. And I think the question of the text is this, are you willing today to lay down a casual connection to Jesus and pick up a committed connection to Jesus? So to just crystallize what he's saying here, I think it's at least two things. First thing that John is saying to you watching right now is that the good news is that there is life for you. There is life for you. There is life for you. John's saying that you're out there and you're starting to realize that there's something deeper to life in this space of time that you and I get on this earth that's deeper than what you thought it needed to be. John's saying that there are those of us in this experiment called life who've realized that something's missing and that something was not found in the things we thought it would be found in. John's saying that you ought to consider Jesus because you've been out there trying to find that hope and contentment in every other avenue. You thought it would be found in that new job that you finally landed that was your dream job, but that something is still missing. You thought it was going to be found when you finally landed the dream girl of your life. And although that's good, something's still missing. You thought that it would be found. Okay, I'm starting a family and I'm having kids and I'm on the soccer field with, with my boy and with my girl. And even though that's wonderful, there's still something missing. And you thought it would be found when you finally saw the, the bank statement and the number was the number you've been praying for and dreaming for since you were little. And even though you have that and it's good, there's still something missing. And you thought it would be found when you finally got the acclaim and recognition for your reputation and what you present and what you contribute to the world. But there's still something missing. And John is saying for those of you for whom something's been missing, the good news is that that something that is missing is here, which means that there is life for us. And I heard the old songwriter say, this joy that I have, the world did not give it and the world cannot take it away. He's saying that there is life for us. But the second thing I think he's saying is this, that life has a name and his name is Jesus Christ. And friend, only through him can you know that life and be saved the worth and the contentment and the joy that Christ gives. The world didn't give it and the world can't take it away. This is what I want to, I just want to drop a word. Putting your trust and faith in Jesus is a joy and a worth that transcends trouble. Come on, somebody. When, when, you, when you know Jesus, friend, there, 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 there's, there, there comes this establishing in your soul that is so grounded and so worthwhile that it even transcends the vicissitudes of this life. Uh, next week, I'll uh, commemorate 27 years since my mama went home to be with, with Jesus. My mama loved God. My mom was the most closest person to Jesus I ever did know. And when I was young, uh, she got breast cancer. And she fought that for years and years. And then that breast cancer metastasized and covered her body and with tumors. And uh, mama was dying. And I remember her, uh, her weight vanquishing to the point where she was under 100 pounds. She was literally skin and bones. You could see her ribs and bones protruding from her skin. She was bald-headed from all the chemotherapy. Her skin darkened gruesomely from the radiation. 
my mama was getting ready to go home. And I remember one night, about maybe three weeks before she passed, and even at this point, the cancer had spread to her brain, so it was affecting her brain cognition. And one of those rare days where she was up and alert, I said, Mama, can we just have a prayer meeting together? And I remember being on the foot of my bunk bed with my mama, and uh, we were crying out to Jesus, and we were worshiping God and praying to God. And I remember weeping over my mama and hugging her, saying, Mama, I wish I could take this cancer for you. And she said, Baby, I wouldn't wish this on nobody. And I looked at her and said, But Mama, what are you going to do? To which my mama replied in her muddled voice, Baby, when you have Jesus, it helps you move past what's going on right now. It helps you focus on all the things he's going to do in the future. Baby, when you put your trust and faith in Jesus, it was like you were the poorest person on earth and all of a sudden you discovered that you were sitting on a gold mine. The joy of Jesus transcends our trouble. Little did I know that 12 years later I would have cancer myself. And I had to have one of my kidneys removed. And I was very worried because my mom died from cancer. So I always thought I would die from cancer. And here I am the morning of surgery, packing my bag, getting ready to go into the hospital. My fiance, April, is waiting in the waiting room for me. And I'm heading out of my apartment. And I begin to pray with tears in my eyes and says, Jesus, please heal my body and please touch my doctors, and please, Lord God, use them to, to heal me. Lord, if that's your will, please, God, get me out of this so I can get back to my fiance and, and keep on moving forward in my life. But the fear and the weight of reality just overcame me as I considered the truth that just because I'm, I'm having this surgery doesn't mean this surgery is going to be successful. Sure enough, this surgery may I may not even wake up. And I had to kind of go there in my prayers, North Coast. And I'll never forget that morning of the surgery, praying and saying, God, the truth is I might meet you today. And I couldn't finish the prayer because when he forced me into a wedge, to recognize the reality that I may meet him, the thought of meeting him gave me such peace and such contentment. And I heard Paul saying, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. I finished the prayer and said, amen, because it was in that moment, North Coast, that I realized that faith in Jesus transcends trouble. Ricky, why should I accept Jesus why should I put my trust and faith in him? Because the best news of the gospel is this. Salvation does not mean I'm safe from dying, but it does guarantee that I'm safe in dying. And I want to come right to your neighborhood and beg this question of your soul, friend. Do you have that safety? Because even though John is forcing us into this corner, he's forcing into this corner for good reason so that you can make sure that you have the safety found only in a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what John is saying. So as we round second base, I want to beg this question. How then is John saying what he is saying? I want you to think argument here, okay? Translation, how does John pull this off? Now, when we left off in the previous weekend, from verse 5, notice that John says, Who is it that overcomes the world except the, the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? And now as we start our passage today, he says, This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. And if you're not careful, you won't even notice the subtle nuance here that John is trying to pull off. In the last pa passage, he recognized Jesus rightly as the Son of God. But to titillate the ears and hearts of his readers, he says, This Jesus who is the son of God is Jesus Christ. And that would have percolated the minds of his readers because the word Christ, okay, would have been understood as the promised Messiah, the savior of the entire world that God promised was coming to deliver us from all of our sins. And my point is this, when John rightly refers to Jesus Christ as both the son of God and as the promised Christ, John is saying essentially he really is that dude. He the one. 
that the, the, this talk of giving you life and giving you hope and contentment, it is, it, it is not a gong show. It is not a, a drummed up circus. He's saying in actual fact, this is the one true son of God. This is the second person of the Godhead. This is the Christ. He really can do it for you. Which means everything that follows then must become then an apologetic. When you're apologetic, think defense of this beautiful reality that Jesus is the Christ. Jesus really is that dude. Jesus really is that one. So the question becomes this, how does then John pull it off? And as we said earlier at the beginning, the word testimony or testify is peppered all throughout our passage. Indeed, the word testimony or testify appears eight times. But you'll notice in verses 9 and 10 how John says that God has born, okay, this testimony concerning his son. The word born there and the word testify and testimony are actually the same word. Both born, testify, and testimony come from the root Greek word martyria. Martyria, M-A-R, Taria. That's how you spell it, okay? The idea of martyria here is the idea, uh, it comes from the English word martyr. The word martyr means witness. That's all that it means. But in the early histories of the church as New Testament Christians and then the early church began to espouse their faith and the surrounding empire began to persecute them and even execute them, History is, has countless, countless records of how several Christians who are even about to be burned at the stake or thrown into the lions are crucified with their dying words. They would witness that Jesus Christ is truly the son of God. And because they would faithfully witness Jesus with their dying words, this idea of martyr began to mean a person who's willing to die for their faith. So in his own way, John is saying, I'll die for this, that you'll understand that this testimony about who Jesus is really is true. So essentially, when you see testify and when you see testimony peppered throughout the text, Paul is saying, I'm saying this as emphatically as I possibly can, that Jesus Christ really is the one. He's saying in so many ways, he really was born of a virgin. He really did satisfy hundreds of Old Testament prophecies. He really was the son of David. He really did perform miracles. He really did teach in such a way that it confounded the religious leaders of his day. He really did die physically on a cross. He really was buried in a grave. But early Sunday morning, he really did get up from the dead. And for 40 days, he really did appear among hundreds of witnesses. And 40 days later, he ascended before 500 witnesses. And one day, he really is coming back again. This passage is about witnessing that that stuff happened, y'all. And that you and I don't get to just move past it. C.S. Lewis said, you've got to make a choice about Jesus. He's either a lunatic, he is either a liar, or he is Lord. And what will your choice be? He's witnessing, okay, to the reality that Jesus Christ really is the Son of God that he is the one who truly can satisfy all of your needs. Uh, back in the day, there was an old attorney show called uh, Perry Mason. Okay, move over Allie McBeal, and sadly, half of you don't even know who that is. But it was an old school TV show called Perry Mason. As a super sleuth attorney, and Perry Mason used to always say, what makes a good witness is a person who's just willing to tell the truth by admitting what he saw, by admitting what he heard. That's what John's doing here. He's telling you what he saw, and he's telling you what he heard. And in his own way, he's bringing more witnesses to the witness stand to testify who Jesus Christ is. Now, North Coast, what I want to do now is do my Chris Brown impersonation because in many ways, John starts to evoke the sense of a courtroom atmosphere as he now calls various witnesses to the stand. Notice in verse 6, he says that Jesus Christ, here it is, Jesus Christ, 
This is one who came by water and blood. And then he adds the spirit. And in my sanctified imagination, John here is becoming an eternity who's calling different witnesses to bring verifiable convincing that Jesus Christ really is who he says he is. So let me put on my Chris Brown voice and say it this way. And so John, the aged, weathered apostle and attorney, now begins to eat his way towards the courtroom and the double doors open. He has a hunched back and he is stumbling with the methodical limp as he leans upon his wooden cane heading down the center aisles towards the judge's bench. His wrinkles are deepened by decades of wear and tear as he's labored for almost 50 years to lift up that faith that he's willing to give his life for. His brow is muddled with strain and stress from serving the churches for over half of his life. He is weathered, he is browbeaten, he is torn down. But the people who are watching this attorney watch walk in cannot help but notice that there's still a twinkle in his eye. And in my sanctified imagination, John comes down to the bench and says, Your Honor, I call the water to the stand. And there's a hush that falls over the crowd as the water from the River Jordan approaches the witness stand, the water where Jesus was baptized. You see, what John here is doing is saying that I bear witness that Jesus was baptized, just like we said he was. And the water takes the stand and the bailiff comes to the water and says, do you promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? And the water says, I do. And John starts to interrogate his witness. And he says, water, can you testify that Jesus Christ was baptized? And the water begins to go through the entirety of the story. And and he says that I remember it like it was yesterday. I remember that Jesus got into my waters and then his cousin John the Baptist came and they baptized him. And up until that point, it was like any other old baptism. But then, John, I'll never forget the strangest thing happened. I looked up in the sky and the heavens began to open and the dove descended. And what happened next we will never forget. I heard a voice that shook the very ripples of my surfaces. And I heard the voice of God say, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And John says, can you confirm that Jesus Christ was baptized of John the Baptist and that the voice echoed the witness of God that he truly is the son of God. And the water says, I absolutely do this. John says, your honor, I have no further questions. And the water is dismissed. John looks at the bench and he says, your honor, I would like now to call the blood to the stand. And the blood of Jesus Christ walks to the stand and the bailiff says, do you promise to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? The blood says, I do. And then John says, where were you there on the day that Jesus died? And the blood says, I'll never forget it. I remember that, 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 that there was this trial with Pontius Pilate and Jesus was sentenced to death and immediately they began to start beating him. And I could still see the Romans with the cat of nine tails whipping Jesus' body and putting a crown of thorns on his head as the blood I came streaming down from Jesus' body. And they put nails in the Savior's feet and nails in his hand. They put a spear in his side. They hung him on a cross. And I remember I came streaming Dreaming down, and I got to thinking, John, that this reminded me of what a songwriter would say decades and decades later, what drops of grief can ne'er repay the debt of love I owe. And John says, blood, you are under oath. Tell me right now, did Jesus really die on the cross? And the blood says, I stand as witness. Jesus is the son of God who died for the sins of the world that day. And John says, your honor, I have no further question. And it seems as if North Coast that the case is all but clear, but John calls a third witness. He says, Your Honor, I call the Spirit of God to the bench. And it got quiet as the third person of the Godhead's holy presence walked under the witness stand. And John says, Spirit of God, do you promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? And the Spirit of God in a humbled voice says, I am the truth. <laughs> And John begins to interrogate his witness and says, can you say with certainty that Jesus Christ is who he says he is? And the spirit says, 
I was with him before time and I'll be with him after time is consumed. And my ministry, as Jesus spoke of me in John 16 and 17, was to tell the entire world who he is and bear witness that he is the one that God promised was coming. He is the one that God said would be a suffering servant. He is the one that God said will be bruised for our iniquities and that the chastisement of our peace will be a one him. And I can bear witness that third day on Sunday morning through the power of God, we rose him from the dead and only through faith in him can you be saved. And the John, the attorney looks at the judge and says, your honor, I rest my case. The water and the blood and the spirit agree. Hear it. Jesus Christ is who he says he is. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. And notice how John says in the text, verse 9, if we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. This is interesting because Deuteronomy, the Old Testament, had dictated for the Jews that a veritable witness in court had to have two other witnesses to be verified unquestionable as true. It's interesting that John in our text is very, very careful to let you know that there are three witnesses here. And the point here is that this, if you'll believe a witness from man, how much more should you believe a witness from God himself about who he says of his son? Amen? So as we round third and head home, the last question I want to beg of our time together is this. How will we respond? What's the verdict? John is saying that I've given you evidence. And now as the faithful jury, you've got to decide, how will I judge Jesus? Is he the one my soul longs for? Or is he not? So notice John promises that trust in Jesus means that you'll have life, that you'll have the testimony of God on the inside of you. Eternal life is not just a quantity of life. Eternal life is a quality of life. The idea is that God wants to be a part of your life, not just to give you fire insurance later, but to give you hope insurance now. And my question is, how will you decide? In keeping with our courtroom uh, theme, I'm reminded that if Jesus paid the price, all you need to do is accept the good news of what he did. The story is told of a single mama who had accumulated uh, too many a parking ticket. And finally, she gets a final parking ticket and her... Um, wheel is blocked off and she can no longer get around. She's forced to go to court and there she stands on the bench there before the judge who's high up atop his bench and the judge looks down at the woman and says, Madam, you've got too many parking tickets and I don't get to change the law. You owe the court $100 or else I'm going to have to send you to jail. The woman bursts into tears and says, Your Honor, I'm so sorry, but I'm behind on my rent behind on my bills and you just don't understand I've gone through some terrible things in my life and there's no way I can afford a hundred dollars the judge replies madam it does not matter the law is the law you owe the courts one hundred dollars and if you do not pay today I will have to throw you in jail it is then that the woman with tears in her eyes begs for mercy and says, Your Honor, is there nothing else you can do? I know I deserve it. I know I did wrong, but I cannot pay this fine. It is impossible for me to pay it. Finally, the judge takes a deep breath and says, Ma'am, stop right there. And with bated breath in the courtroom, the judge stands up and he unzips his robe and he takes his robe off. And he puts on his suit coat that he wore that morning and he comes down to the lady and pulls out his wallet and pulls out a crisp $100 bill and tucks it inside her hand. He then methodically walks back up to the bench, takes off his suit coat, puts his robe back on and zips it up and looks at the woman and says for a third time, ma'am, I cannot change the law. You owe the court $100 or I'm going to throw you to jail. And drying her eyes, the woman says, good news, your honor. I can pay my fine because somebody paid the price. And so the gospel is this. 
2,000 years ago, in a drastic move, Jesus Christ took off the garments of heaven and put on the garments of humanity and came down to where we are, and he paid our price. That all who look to him may know that all you need to do is accept the good news that Jesus Christ has paid your price, that he longs for you not just to have a quantity of life, but a quality of life, to stop dancing with the world, but to keep dancing, but just change partners. Would you accept him now by simply whispering these words, Jesus, you really are that dude. You really are that God who has paid for my sin, who is the one true God of heaven. And only through you can I even have an idea of what life really is all about. Wash me and cleanse me of my sins. Come into my heart. And Father God, help me to enjoy not just the quantity of life later, but the quality of life now as I walk with you hand in hand, day after day after day. Fill my heart with Christ. Love on me, O oh God, and make me yours. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, we welcome you to God's kingdom, and we look forward to journeying with you as we make much of Jesus in the world today. Until I meet again with you next time, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and to be gracious to you. And the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon each and every one of you and bring you peace. And I ask this blessing in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks for joining us for today's message. And a couple quick things for you. Number one, to get signed up for a life group, simply go to our website. And then if you would like to join us for our devotional, simply text the keyword study to this phone number right here on the screen. Thanks for joining us. We look forward to having you next week.